Thank you for joining us and good morning to everyone and welcome to once again our panel, The Power of Intersectionality, Coming Together to Drive Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Yamamoto. I am the main anchor at KPX5 CBS News Bay Area, our parent company, Paramount Global, where across the country we have seen Asian Americans and those of Asian descent in the news for many of the wrong reasons. A recent report here in San Francisco, the area that my station covers, we saw a 567% increase in reports of hate crimes. And across the nation, a report recently revealed that the Asian anti-hate crimes increased by 339% last year compared to the year before. And the group Stop AAPI Hate reported 3,795 incidents of violence against Asians in America between 2020, 2021. But we also must note that women reported hate incidents 2.3 times more than men. So this is where we begin to talk about intersectionality and how it plays its role. AAPI hate for men may be much different for it is for Asian women. It also may be much different for elderly Asians compared to the younger generation. But what exactly does intersectionality mean? If you, if you Google it, uh, you come up with this definition, and I'll just read it to you. Intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression, and we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people, whether it's gender, race, class, sexual orientation, physical ability, and, and that list goes on. But to better explain what this means and how it applies to our present time on both a very broad and, and a very personal level, we have an extraordinary panel. I also wanna mention that we, everyone watching and listening to become part of the conversation. So if you have questions, please ask through the chat and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. But first, please welcome Abina Ayer, technical expert at iTech India and transgender activist. Also, Max Sevilla, Vice President of Government Relations, Advocacy, and Community Engagement with the Anti-Defamation League. And Kenji Yoshino, Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law and the Director of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging with the uh, New York, um, excuse me, New York School of Law. And so, Kenji, let, let's begin with you. How do you define intersectionality? Well, first, let me say, Ryan, it's such a pleasure to be here with you with this distinguished panel. And I want to thank the Asia Society for uh, its hospitality and convening this forum. So as a law professor, I have to say, like, I want to flex a little bit here because intersectionality comes into the popular lexicon through a law professor's work, the great Kimberly Crenshaw at Columbia. So Kimberly Crenshaw started on this work when she was looking at the interests of Black women in litigation. So she looked at this fascinating case, Ryan, where a group of Black women brought a class action against an uh, automobile manufacturer. And this case gets before a judge and claims of race discrimination and sex discrimination are brought. And as Crenshaw looks at this case, she realizes that the judge says, is there race discrimination? And then he says, no, because I see that some Black men have made it to the executive ranks. Then he turns to the sex discrimination claim and says, has there been sex discrimination? No, because some white women have made it to the executive ranks. And then he says, no race discrimination, no sex discrimination. End of case. This is over. And what Crenshaw points out really, really insightfully is to say there's a group of individuals who are left out in the cold, namely the black woman who brought the case in the first place. And so her point is that if the law engages in a kind of axis by axis uh, kind of analysis, it's going to miss out on groups that belong to more than one subordinated identity, as many of us do. So many of us have plural identities, and you know we operate at the intersection of those. So just to land the plane here with regard to the terrifying and horrifying uh, spike in uh, anti-Asian hate crimes, the point that you raise is a really good one. It's an intersectional point. If you look at the Atlanta shootings, if you were to analyze that solely through a race lens and to say this is anti-Asian hate, you would be missing something. And if you analyze it solely through a gender lens and said this is like anti-gender or anti-woman you know, hate crimes, you would also be missing something. What we actually were dealing with in the Atlanta shooting case, as, at least as I understand it, is that you know, the super majority of individuals who were victims were Asian women, right? And they were targeted not as Asians, not as women alone, but as Asian women. 
So until we get a more fine-grained sense of the multiple layers of identity we have, we're not fully seeing each other as human beings. Thank you, Kenji. Abina, I, I wanna thank you. You're joining us all the way from India. Uh, what does intersectionality mean to you? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. And I would really like to appreciate uh, Asia Society for organizing this is wonderful and very, very important uh, session because I think this is what we are dealing right now. It is a very, very persistent topic for our daily lives. I think just to explain my point, I just want to show uh, like one or two slides just to help us understand. Uh, you know, I, I belong to uh, a community which is called as a transgender community. And uh, just to help you understand transgender people, um, in Asian countries are, are highly discriminated. Like uh, the entire world's 19% of transgender populations stay in Asia, uh, particularly. Uh, and they are they are extremely vulnerable for health. They are extremely vulnerable for uh, so, uh, in various other aspects like uh, gender-based violence. Uh, they lag with the services that they get from the welfare or any other services. The unfortunate part about that, a lot of these transgender women are not being considered as women. And a lot of transgender men are not considered as a man. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about binaries, they are completely, uh, you know, a swarm apart because they're not part of the entire uh, gender gamut, which is for the normalized people. Uh, though WHO and various other organizations talks about gender equality and various other aspects, various countries, uh, various states in, in Asia countries uh, are not so friendly towards sexual minority LGBTI people transgender people and that is the reason why many times uh, people who belong to sexual minorities go through something called as a stigma onion. Um, and uh, just to help to understand many times people doesn't even know how many people are like us, like from the LGBTI community, from transgender community, which, uh, which live in countries because our laws don't support them. Our social um, or religious, uh, you know, understanding is not open and out about accepting these individuals. And we unfortunately go through the stigma layer of onion. So you peel one layer of onion and you see a different kind of uh, stigma and discrimination that comes your way. Uh, and that leads to a lack of inclusion in a society. So like, for example, I am a trans woman. I am also a woman of color. I may be living with HIV. I may be, uh, you know, a person who, uh, who, uh, who, uh, who don't get, uh, you know, respect uh, in a society. I may be a a person who who is left behind from my own family uh, and I don't have any uh, support. I may be under a substance abuse. So you peel one layer and then there is another layer that you have it. So today when we talk about intersexuality, what I want to talk about it is that when we talk about intersexuality, we have to talk about three major principles. One is that we have to learn from each other's friends. So who are left out is something that brought into the momentum and we, we have to create a collective movement. So I remember in America and various other countries, you know, um, uh, you you see the the there are when the black women were fighting, transgender people were fighting with them. Uh, you know, when gay people were fighting, transgender people were holding that entire Stonewall march. Uh, so we need to have a learning from our cross border movement. The second is particularly about when we talk about intersectionality, is that we need to understand our issues so that we can talk on each other's behalf many times because many times people like me will be not present in all the platforms and I need somebody I need allies to talk about my issues uh, into various aspects and third thing is about basically is that you know creating uh, creating uh, support system creating creating mechanism to document the violence creating mechanism to document uh, the, the, the lack of inclusion and discrimination that faced by uh, various individuals who belong to LGBTI community or for other intersectionality uh, that are there in the Asia region. Thank you so much, Ryan, uh, for your opportunity. Yeah, yeah thank you, Abina. And, and Max, who represents the ADL, I mean, when we talk about intersectionality, it is a very broad word, but it's also very a personal word because it affects everyone in different ways. Absolutely, Ryan. Thank you for the question. And uh, thanks to the Asia Society for having me and having ADL um, included in this important panel. And it's a privilege to be with such esteemed colleagues. Um, you know, I'm a government relations uh, professional. And so I look at it from 
the implementation from sort of like the advocacy work that we do. Uh, and you spoke about sort of the record numbers of uh, incidents against uh, Asian Americans in the United States over the past couple of years. And um, I think back as to the ADL information with regards to the number of incidents of anti-Semitism in the United States. We last two weeks ago, we released our ADL audit on anti-Semitic incidents, and we saw a 34% increase. It's a record number of anti-Semitism that we've seen in the United States since ADL has been accounting for these since 1979, 34% increase from last year. And to me, it reflects the interconnected experiences the um, of like-minded communities with shared circumstances including overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. And I think that the numbers uh, reflect sort of the situation in this case of the uh, Jewish American community and the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, and so for me as a practitioner, it's the way that I approach the work of advocacy and community relations. And it's the idea that in order to face this sort of um, alarming discrimination, racism, et cetera, we must do it together. We must find the shared commonalities uh, and learn uh, um, to overcome the potential differences between our communities, because what unites us really is key to um, building a, a better world and a safer world. And I reflect back right over the past couple of years, unfortunately, because of COVID and because of irresponsibility from uh, national leaders, we've seen this uptick in discrimination vis-a-vis um, -vis the API community. Um, and for ADL, it was a priority for us to share our best practices and to show not just solidarity, but support for the API community. And so one example of how we've done that, ADL, you know, we are a hundred plus year organization. Unfortunately, um, anti-Semitism is called the oldest hate. Um, we've got, unfortunately, a lot of experience here. And so I reflect back on, on two uh, examples of what we've done over the past year. One is that ADL CEO uh, got together with a number of API leaders to, um, form and start the uh, Asian American Foundation. It's a grant making organization. Jonathan Greenblatt, ADL's uh, CEO, is the only non -AP API board member. And when it launched, it started with a little over $100 million. Uh, and soon after, we built it to a billion dollars to support the great uh, organizations in the API community that are needed in order to fend off and combat this sort of uh, increase in hate that we've seen. Uh, just one more example of the important work of intersectionality that we've been uh, prioritizing over the past couple of years. Uh, I think Kenji mentioned the Atlanta shooting, um, probably one of the most emotionally taxing days in the two and a half years that I've been at ADL was when uh, that attack happened in Atlanta and being in a group of a very diverse group of national leaders uh, advising the CEO of a national API organization as to how to um, a, a, a involve himself and support the community in Atlanta and this individual and this community had not gone through these sort of mass killing experiences, fortunately. Um, but at ADL, we have had many of these situations. And so we had experience in how to help the victims and the families and help heal and support the community. And it was something that we brought um, us and unfortunately other communities did the same in in you know in sharing and in support of our community partners and i think that it that to me is what interse intersectionality uh means and what the potential and necessity is yeah allyship is so important and, and i just wanted to ask this question why do we think the that we're seeing a rise in attacks whether it's asian americans transgender lgbtq anti-semitic attacks why are we seeing this rise now I would say, if I can jump in, yeah. that it's really a product of exactly what Max is talking about. And there's a potential 
kind of silver lining there uh, for solidarity, right? I, I think that we're seeing attacks against all groups that are considered to be outside um, the dominant groups in American society because we've become so diverse as a nation and we've become so much more pluralistic. So, you know, the exact date varies, but, you know, sometime in the 2040s, whites will be a minority of American society. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of backlash against the demographic changes that are irreversible and inexorable in the society. And the kind of last gasp of majority groups who feel incredibly threatened is to strike out at groups that they deem to be the other in some way. And that becomes, as you say, Ryan, very ecumenical. It can be you know, anti-Jewish, it can be anti-gay, it can be anti-Asian, right? And so we have to decide, right, as to whether or not our response to that is gonna be, oh, let's just circle the wagons around our own community, right, and just protect ourselves, or whether we're gonna be able to open up a peripheral vision and say, we can actually be allies to other groups who are also uh, the victims of this hatred. They're actually, if we create a coalition, there are more of us than there are the people who hate us, right? Uh, and who are engaging these hate crimes. And so therefore, uh, that's uh, the kind of case for solidarity. I think just to be really clear about how intersectionality um, feeds into this, you know, allyship is one thing. That's when one group is just an ally to a totally separate group. Intersectionality is a little bit like allyship on, on steroids, and it feels more like solidarity. So I happen to be a gay, you know, Asian man. You know, decades ago when, you know, I first came out of the closet, you know, the gay movement was very white and the Asian movement was very sort of heteronormative and heterosexual. Right. And I'm really pleased to see that both movements have evolved to understand that there are people like me and that we can actually form human bridges right in between those two communities. So very similar to what my colleagues were talking about. You know, when these Asian hate crimes started spiking, people would come to me and say, well, you've experienced this as a gay man, like being afraid of public space, you know, having that kind of third eye looking around. I think Abi can probably relate to this as well, uh, of making sure that you're physically safe in a particular space, not here in Brooklyn where I'm uh, zooming in from. But, you know, if I'm in the Middle East or if I'm in Texas, like I will have that third eye and I'll constantly be aware of my surroundings, particularly if I'm with my husband or I'm with my kids. And now it's really interesting that I actually feel more threatened, at least in New York City, as an Asian individual than as a gay individual. But, you know, I can be that human bridge. You know, I can use one experience to inform the other, not just for myself, but for the communities to which I belong. Yeah. Ryan, if I may, um, uh, picking up on what Kenji was saying, in the Jewish community, 14% of the American Jewish community is of sort of mixed identity. Uh, myself included, I'm Jewish, uh, Latino, um, and, and those are really important bridges to the work of intersectionality. Um, we actually, we were doing, it, it happen, May happens to be both uh, a Jewish Heritage Month as well as API Heritage Month, and we're taking advantage of that. We actually have a fellow doing work, a uh, Japanese American Jewish fellow at ADL that's doing work on um, on discrimination globally, uh, and we are using this occasion to bring the Jewish and Japanese American communities together through these uh, individuals that are bridges uh, and learning from one another, learning from each other's experience. We are uh, talking of that intersectionality, um, and then we are also learning from one another and talking about internment camps and, uh, you know, the events of the 40s and sort of building a better understanding of each other's community in order to then have a much stronger foundation in order to, ch to face the challenges um, that, that you were asking about. And I think that those challenges in part come, yes, because of... Um, of the changing demographics in the United States, also because of the very polarizing moment that we live in. And it's, uh, you know, we have been living through a pandemic. We've got irresponsible national leadership, well, local and state irresponsible leadership too. Um, uh, we, the, the internet has played a huge role in sort of uh, augmenting these voices uh, with, with, you know, that espouse conspiracy theories and hate, and they're finding uh, outlets and ways to mobilize and threaten all of our communities in ways that we had not seen uh, prior to social media and the internet having such a hold on our lives. And, and to transition with that, so what, what has been the role of social media 
from a negative or even a positive level? Abina, what have you seen? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, before that, just quickly talk about, uh, particularly about, uh, think uh, that my colleagues were also talking about. I wanted to show you just quick uh, data about uh, Asia region. And you see it here that we're talking about particularly the LGBTI community and you see the perpetrators of violence is from everywhere. Okay. And in countries like India, I wanted to give an example. Like we managed to repeal the section 377 and we have also uh, sort of, you know, kind of uh, got a transgender act uh, together. Transgender people are legal. But despite of that, the violence against the transgender people have increased. It has not decreased. Mm -hmm. So we were like, oh my God, how is it happening? Uh, you know that it should be reduced, right? I mean, if it is, if you are legal and if you are accepted in a country, and if if no no if everybody understands that, see, listen, the Supreme Court has given them this judgment. Why are they still being discriminated? What we have found out is that policies don't change the mindset of people. You create a people movement, and the things would change. So a lot of times when we talk about intersectionality, I think a lot of people are not aware about intersectionality. A uh, lot of people are ignorant about that. They wear blinkers. They are not aware about it. Neither we talk to our kids, neither we talk to our subordinates about it. Now, your second point about the social media, it has played a huge role. But unfortunately, land for the communities like us who are not literate enough, only 35% of literacy are there among the transgender people in some of the countries. It could go lesser than that. You know, for us, using social media effectively for talking about rights also becomes, uh, you know, uh, uh, limited. Uh, many times. And when we talk about social media, there are many times hate crimes comes to us from the so social media perspective whenever we try to talk about our policy related work or our advocacy or our issues in, in general uh, about, about it is. We lack with the infrastructure, we lack with the rights and we lack with the welfare. Many times when we talk about larger LGBTI movement also and I wanted to particularly talk about it, if I'm a gay, if I'm a lesbian, I can get selected into the my binaries of this world. I will get an opportunity to education unless and until I've been like, you know, extremely out and open there, like as a queer person. But a transgender person is visible. You know, we are we are invisibly visible people. So people know that we are there, but people don't want to give us the opportunity to prove our, our, our situation. As a result of that, we are shut down from our social uh, welfare. We are shut down from the employment. We are shut down from the education. And we are shut down on uh, the representation at the policy level. And we are trapped into the vicious circle. And unfortunately, we don't even sometimes get enough support from our LGBT, larger LGBTI people uh, that is required. Because many times we also get stigmatized within the LGBTI uh, communities because ma many of us are living under the poverty. Uh, uh, many of us are are, are uh, with the colored people, and many of us are uh, not do not have a social educational status to match up to the other people where we can be called as on equal platform. But social media has a huge power. If you use it rightly, you can create a lot of difference. I would agree with Max. We we should unite, and I think we should empower the people to use social media effectively. Uh, and I think the most important part about it is how you deliver the message to create a social movement around intersectionality is something which is important. We derive from each other's strength and we, we derive from each other's, um, um, you know, kind of learnings that we have gone through. And that is what is more important. Like as a trans person, I need to learn from gay people. I need to learn from black women. I need to learn from other people and use that into my work that I'm doing whether it is physical, whether it is social, whether it is, uh, you know, outreach or any other things, how I move on my agenda. And I also feel that is intersectionality is all about, uh, I've said this before and I'm saying it again, it's about sisterhood and brotherhood. Uh, we, if we don't stand for each other's right in collectively, uh, uh, you know, tomorrow people will strike against us and we will not have anything to protect. You look at the examples of Ukraine or any other thing. So, so people will be discriminating us. People will be talking about our separations. Now it is time for us to forget about uh, intersectionalities that we have and we come together as our strength to talk for each other and be part of our each other's movement basically. Thank you. Ryan, if I may uh, follow up to your question, and I agree with Avina that uh, social media and the internet has uh, the potential of a very positive contribution. It allows all of us working in partnership, in allyship, to organize, to raise each other's voices. Um, it, it can have an incredibly positive effect. 
on the other hand, the other side of that same coin is that it's being used and abused by those seeking to discriminate against uh, minority and vulnerable communities. Uh, and let me make that point uh, in two ways. One is by sharing some data from an ADL survey and also um, sharing um, something more, a little bit more anecdotal. So um, ADL does an annual survey uh, of hate and harassment on social media. And the last time we put this out, it was in uh, early 2021, and it showed that the level of online hate and harassment reported by users had increased from all their previous years, and 41% of Americans said that they themselves have experienced online harassment in the past year in terms of the API community. Um, the, the, that's the community that had experienced the uh, largest single year over year rise in severe online harassment with over 17% 17, 17 of the people responding to the survey saying that they had faced severe online hate and harassment. Um, and somewhat more anecdotally, we are seeing sort of corroboration of these. In 20 or late 2020, when President Trump was diagnosed with COVID, ADL used a new tool that we had our engineers develop to measure the uh, levels of hate online, specifically on Twitter. And we used that to understand the uptick, the increase of anti-AAPI, anti-Asian American um, sentiment on Twitter at the time of that, of that diagnosis. And over the first 12 hours of the president being diagnosed with COVID, we saw an 85% increase in anti API language and conspiracy theories. Mm. You know, um, I, I thought that that was very telling. It lasted for about five more days before it decreased to sort of like more normal, normal uh, hate uh, and harassment against the API community uh, on on Twitter. But it was a very clear and very significant spike uh, related to a lot of the conspiracy theories and the responsible language that was being used at the time and unfortunately in various spaces continues to be used. And, and building on that, there's no question that social media has been a tool to to attack people of color and and and, and attack people in, in, in different ethnic groups and and but how can it be used to to uplift it and, and and unite people? So many times I feel social media is has a very easy access to connect with each other. Like the distance wise, I'm just saying that is, you know, you can unite from the countries, you can unite from the movement building. And at the same time, I feel that is there is uh, there is there is a good opportunity for us to share data uh, that Max is talking about with like, for example, if, if the data which is Max is showing, uh, if that can be used in some of my countries for advocacy or something like that, because evidence based advocacy always, always works. So I feel social media could be a very strong medium to to do that. Uh, to use that and and I just feel that is if you want to use effective social media then you need to create champions you need to create leaders and and the leadership can be uh, cannot be taught into the classrooms but it could be taught from one movement to another so cross sectionality movement building will be very very helpful if it has been used very wisely effectively and strategically on the social media and so I know we're here to talk about the problems and the issues happening within the Asian American community. But I, I have to bring this up just because this literally happened in the past week. And Kenji, you, you and I were chatting about this earlier, uh, the whole Roe v. Wade decision or the possible overturning of Roe v. Wade. And you're saying this could have implications far beyond just Roe v. Wade. Yeah, and it goes back to the theme that we are all rehearsing about um, allyship. Uh, and intersectionality, right? Because you look at that, you know, leaked opinion um, from uh, Justice Alito that overturns Roe versus Wade. And, you know, I as a man might look at that and say, well, you know, this is, I need to be an ally, right? To uh, the woman or my life who, for whom this is a very precious right. But as a constitutional law scholar, when I read that opinion, I begin to realize that you know, it's not just a question of being an ally, it's a question of being directly implicated by the opinion myself, right? So that if you look at the opinion, what it says is, 
unenumerated rights, which are rights that are nowhere textually referred to in the Constitution, will only be protected if they're deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. And so if you apply that formula to any number of other precedents that the Supreme Court has handed down, that affects almost every group you know, that's represented here today. Right? So you know, if you look at the same-sex marriage decision in 2015, or the right to engage in consensual sexual intimacy, that opinion in 2003, neither of those rights were deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. Neither is contraception, if you go back to 1965. Neither is interracial marriage, if you go back to 1967, right? So I just want to underscore that something that seems like, oh, you know, I'm outside of this and I should be an ally. If you look at it through a more kind of intersectional lens, it actually directly implicates you. There isn't a racial minority. There isn't a gay person. You know, there isn't any kind of individual in American society who isn't directly affected by this decision. Yeah, I and when you know. So sorry, Ryan, I would agree with uh, everything that Kenji said on, you know, we're talking about religious rights, we're talking about women's rights, we're talking about uh, privacy uh, and individual rights. So like just from a sort of like legal perspective as to the questions of law, not even about sort of the, the impact, both in terms of precedent and the impact on individuals, you can see that this is a far reaching um, sort of uh, of um, of potential decision. I mean, let's keep in mind that it was a leaked draft on the way that the Supreme Court works. They circulate drafts that may, could potentially significantly change before they're issued, and yet it poses a very serious uh, and concerning uh, awareness of, of a potential situation. And so, as everything is connected with each other, when you talk about intersectionality, and it's not just beyond Roe v. Wade, we're also talking about other issues that might be coming up within the Supreme Court or within the court of law, and that's affirmative action. And that directly affects Asian Americans. And so Kenji, you and I were talking about that also. Um, how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Yeah, so you know, I think it's really hard for the Asian American community, oftentimes, at least many individuals that I'm talking to, to sort of find their way through this thicket of affirmative action, right? Because there are two separate issues that often get conflated here. One is whether or not you believe that Asian Americans should be discriminated against in college admissions, right? And I think all of us on this call can get behind the idea that Asian Americans should not be discriminated against in college admissions, right? So this idea that, you know, Asian Americans would be subjected to higher standards, to have higher SAT scores, to have whatever, than even the dominant group, white individuals, uh, in applying to these colleges is something that I think we can all set our faces against, right? I want to just aggregate that from this notion of affirmative action for Black individuals or Latinx individuals who are individuals who are underrepresented in uh, American society and American universities. And having affirmative action for those individuals is not the same thing as discriminating against Asian individuals. You can say Asian individuals should be treated the same as white individuals. But, you know, Latinx and Black individuals should get a bump, right, when they are admitted to uh, being considered for admission to universities. And what I really worry about, and I'm certainly not the first or only person who has made this claim, is that, you know, dominant group interests are using Asian Americans as a kind of cat's paw to advance their own interests, right, to abolish affirmative action across the board. Of, it's very, very unsympathetic to say, oh, look at this poor white, you know, individual who didn't get into medical school. That's the Alan Backey case. And so they pivot, you know, in terms of which plaintiffs are picking. So suddenly it's white women. And that's the Texas cases, like whether that's, you know, Abigail Fisher or going back earlier to the Michigan case, Barbara Grutter. And then finally, they got smart enough to say, let's pit minorities against each other. So in the Harvard case, it's sort of Asian individuals, right, against black individuals. And there's this kind of inter- racial politics going on. And I think that's a very, very dangerous game, right, for us to be you know, participating in and that we should just not let ourselves be used in that way. And so I think that we can actually create, as Max and Abino are both saying, this kind of solidaristic mindset that will pay that kind of solidarity dividend that Heather McGee talks about, right, rather than allowing this kind of infighting to destroy us all. And when you talk about allyships, is there that danger of pitting each other against each other? 
I think we're already seeing it, right? I think we're already seeing, you know, Asian Americans being lofted up as like these model minorities, right? Starting, I'm sure earlier than this, but, you know, when I came into consciousness, George H.W. Bush was like, you know, uh, on this issue, he was saying things like, oh, celebrate the Asians, you know, they are the model minorities, they're the great hope for America, right? And, you know, I, I always sort of remind people when they're kind of receiving, when we're all receiving the kind of model minor- minority sort of pat on the head of where the good minorities, like, what does that actually mean to Abina's point? What does that mean for our brothers and sisters? What does that mean uh, when I'm called a model minority? Because the very idea that we would be called a model minority suggests that there are also problem minorities out there in society. And so the very idea that I would be lofted up as a model minority means that some other racial minority is being pushed down, right? So I always reject that. Whenever I hear any kind of tincture of model minority rhetoric being directed at me, I always say, like, I actually don't accept the model minority term. I'm an individual, you know, I have flaws and, 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 and you know, I have good characteristics and bad characteristics. Even if you sort of expand out to Asian Americans with the group, when people say, oh, Asian Americans have the highest sort of educational or, you know, economic attainment in American society, well, yes and no, right? To take economics, we're touching the floor with one hand and the ceiling with the other, right? Where we have the highest variance of any racial group. Um, can't see my hands, so I should go like this, right? You can't see the variance, right, uh, that exists within uh, Asian society where we have the biggest variance of highest SES and lowest SES of any ethnic group. So, you know, I'd really encourage us to, you know, even in those kind of micro cues, you might not even hear model minorities anything but a compliment, but hear it as saying something about groups to which you do not belong and not just, you know, a compliment that's directed towards your group. So Ryan, and, and it, oh, if sorry, I may please. just to uh, compliment what Kenji just said, uh, I think that that's his, uh, he, his response he mirrors very well with the uh, Jewish American community. Um, the Jewish American community is seen as white uh, facing, uh, as privileged, um, and there is uh, a tendency to ignore the history and, and you know, situation of the Jewish community in the United States, not 50 years ago, uh, Jews, Blacks, uh, and other sort of like minority communities face the exact same sort of discrimination. And while things may have improved in some aspects, they certainly have not improved in all of them. I share with you data as to the level of um, ethnic and, and religious discrimination against the Jewish community in the United States. And, and there continues to be a lot of um, the, the, the sort of uh, um, identity discrimination that some people want to have ignored in order to divide us as opposed to unite us. I also think that there, in particular with the API and Jewish communities, that there is one other aspect of sort of like that divide to conquer sort of strategy that is really important and that we've been seeing over the past few years um, more significantly. There is the perspective of blaming the Asian American or Chinese American community for the actions of foreign governments, uh, China in particular, and uh, the tendency to do something similar with the Jewish American community on the actions of the state of Israel. Uh, and, you know, not any one of us individuals in the United States is responsible for the right or wrong actions of any sort of given country, nor do we necessarily represent their stances or are citizens of those nations. Um, but in the approach and attempt to tie communities to what happens internationally, I think that there is that approach and that attempt to weaken the, the connection that we all have in common on the opportunity that we have if we confront these uh, discrimination uh, as one unit, as one strong uh, allyship. And, and is there a danger, especially we have to keep ourselves in check, and, and I was working on a, a pride story coming up for June, and I was talking with some members of the LGBTQ community, and they said uh, there's, there's sometimes there's a danger once one group receives some rights, we tend to forget about the other groups and some of the other marginalized groups and they, they made a prime example. So once gays started getting some rights here in San Francisco, maybe people from the transgender community started feeling left out. 
And and Abina, I, I don't know if that's a, an appropriate question for you. Or, or do you see that within within your own group? But it happens in both the ways. You know, like for example, mm -hmm. in countries like India, uh, before the gays, um, uh, uh, I mean, before the Section 377, which criminalizes homosexuality, was still there in India. And transgender people in 2014 got uh, acknowledgement as a third gender from the Supreme Court. And immediately the transgender people, so many highest, uh, the leaders of the transgender community started saying that, hey, listen, we are not with you. We are women and our issues are not to do with sexuality. So we don't, we, you know, we don't associate with your movement. What happened is that afterwards, there was a huge amount of crackdown on the LGBTI movement, which was united till that point of time. And uh, uh, then actually suddenly uh, it just happened so that because we were we we were just given the right to be acknowledged as a third gender, but we did not we were not given uh, civil rights, and uh, to you know they realized it all the transgender people and they said hey listen like we cannot leave our brothers and sisters who are from the LGBTI community and we have to create a movement building. They came together very organically. They sat together and he said listen that we we need to keep this entire LGBT queer movement stronger. To, to 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 have to achieve the larger goal larger goal that we collectively can achieve and i think whenever there is a lack of vision uh, within the movement on cross sectionality people benefit from strong uh, small gains but they lose the larger battles uh, that they have to fight and i think that is something that we all have to watch out for uh, I just feel that is, you know, together we stand uh, is something that we have to keep in mind. And I think we have to derive from the strengths from our intersectionality and not penetrate uh, on the gaps uh, that we see within our sense. And I think uh, uh, it is not important that individuals get successful in this entire, I'm talking about LGBTI community, but it is the entire sexual minority community because a lot of our issues and a lot of our problems have the intersectionality connections. Uh, so we to, we have to stand together. I just feel that 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 larger vision building is very important, and even data talks about it. I'm sure whenever you look into data, a lot of data about uh, sexuality, gender will collate collate to each other. They will have the uh, si similar kind of drivers towards that. So I mean, we need to understand that we stand together. I just feel that is very very important. And I, I'm going to have to cut us off because I think we're going over our time right now. I knew this was going to happen because it's such a broad topic and it's so hard to, to talk about intersectionality within a, a 40 minute time frame. So uh, Abina, Max and Kenji, uh, I do want to thank you for your time and your expertise. Uh, it, it's open discussions like these where we, we begin to actually at least try to solve and learn about equity, inclusion and diversity. Uh, maybe we can begin to learn from one another, maybe expand or even reframe our thinking or just better understand and appreciate each other. And, and there's still so many more panels and uh, deep discussions happening today. So please enjoy the rest of Asia Society's uh, 2022 Global Talent, Diversity and Inclusion Virtual Symposium. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.